Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I really, really am looking forward to today's webinar because we have with us Tressie Weeks. She is a special needs focused attorney, and I cannot wait to hear from her. I want to thank you, April, for hosting and for sharing your audience with you. I'm going to let you go first, but I have a few housekeeping items before I let April tell us about her organization. Um, so we're in webinar mode, and that means we cannot see you or hear you. If you have any questions or comments that you would like to share with us, please put those in the chat box. That's the easiest way for, for us to be able to see your questions and comments. And we'll get to as many questions as we can, uh, but we're probably going to save the questions for the end. So you can put it in the chat box so that you don't forget what you wanted to ask. And we'll go through those before we wrap up and make sure we've got as many questions answered as we possibly can. Um, this webinar is being recorded. All of our webinars that we do, we record and we put on our YouTube channel. After the webinar is over, we will send you a link to that recording and we're going to send you all the slides. So any clickable links or anything like that in the slides, you'll be able to have that all later. Um, whatever email you registered with, I hope you didn't give us a fake one, um, but whatever email you registered with is where we're gonna send that information. Um, so again, I thank you all for being here. We're going to be about an hour. I'm going to let April tell us a little bit before we get into Tressie's information, a little bit about her and this great upcoming information. Well, hello, everybody. As the navigator for Grayson, Cook, and Fannin counties, what I do is help connect families with vocational rehabilitation services. And if you don't know what that is, vocational rehabilitation provides services to people with barriers or disabilities to enable them to either maintain the, their current employment, obtain new employment, or even upskill where they're at. And we do that through education and training resources. And we will connect you with an individual counselor that will guide you through that process. My next webinar is going to be accessing Grayson College. I will be meeting with Jeffrey Johnson Hodge, the accessibility coordinator there. And we're going to talk about how to help families gain access to accommodations while they are on campus. That will be Sounds December. Like a good one. Yeah. Mm. So if you'd like to join us, you can just scan the code there and register, and we'll see you then. If not, we will record it and house it on our website. If you want to go ahead and go to the next slide, if you'd like to know how to connect with workforce services or with vocational rehabilitation, you can scan either one of these codes for what you need, and that will help you find your vocational rehabilitation for your region in Texas. We can go ahead and move to the next slide after that. You can also get a hold of vocational rehabilitation through any of these links. And I will go ahead and put my contact information here in the chat box so you can access me that way. And I'll be glad to connect you as well. And then I think maybe I have one more slide, but I'm not certain if you want to advance. Yes, I was go more. going to ask if you wanted to tell us a little bit more about what the VR program is and what you guys do. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, so vocational rehabilitation, we provide for students age 14 to 22, and we offer what's called pre-employment training services. Those are called pre-ETS by some people. And what that looks like is we're going to look at what a student or even an adult wants to do, and then we're going to look at how are they going to get there? What education and training is needed to do that? And what are the services or the gaps in between that we need to fill with services? And we do adult services that are short term. For instance, a lot of people don't know that we can help nurses. We've recently helped several nurses that had some hearing loss get Bluetooth enabled stethoscopes wow. that connect. So. Um, just to throw that out there, there are great services for adults as well, but for students, what it's going to look like is 
They're going to have an individual counselor all the way through high school if they'd like. Those counselors can even come and join in 504 meetings and IEP meetings and be a support to the family for the vocational part of those meetings. So um, we also have workforce centers. And if you're looking for a job, you can come in. We have printers that you can use, accessible work sites, and we can even help with childcare assistance. So that's just kind of an overview of some of the services I can connect you with. And if you have questions, feel free to reach out to me and I'll be glad to help you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, April. And again, for hosting us and for helping share the, the information and spread the word about our companies. It's fantastic. Um, oh, here's some more follow-up resources for April. There's a link down there, or you can use the QR code. This is what their website looks like, right? There's April. That's actually, that's a, a Padlet, and it has vocational rehabilitation resources, and it also has disability etiquette information. I do do local training for employers in Grayson, Cook, and Fannin counties for disability etiquette training as well. Oh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so a little bit about Consolidated Planning Group before we get to Tressy. So today's talk is really about understanding the differences between special needs advisors or planners and special needs focused attorneys and what we each do and how we work as a team to help support you and your family. Um, so Consolidated Planning Group, we are for financial advisors, really, first and foremost. However, almost all of the families that we work with have loved ones who might need care, might need help for the rest of their lives. Um, and when you're thinking about saving for your retirement, that's daunting. But when you also think about the fact that your child might not be able to live independently, might not be able to have a job that is going to provide them with a retirement, and you think, well, you have to leave money for them for a, almost a third bucket of retirement money, you know, yours and your spouse and now your child. Uh, so we help families with that. We've been financial advisors for about 30 years. Our company has been around. Uh, we're located just outside of Houston in the Sugarland area, and we serve families all across Texas and all across the United States with things like um, special needs planning. And I'm going to get into what I mean by that. Uh, but we also do investments and life insurance and securities. Uh, we are members of the Special Needs Planning Academy. And we're nationally certified as social security advisors. So what we do is help families with um, protection plans for their family, you know, helping you understand and mitigate the risks to your financial future and to your loved one being taken care of. Um, we think about the lifetime care costs for your loved ones and how you can help save money now so that once you're gone, they will be taken care of. Um, transition planning is a huge part of it, thinking about all the different benefits and programs available, who you need to contact and when you need to contact them. And you know, a lot changes when your child turns 18, suddenly in the eyes of the law, they're adults. And even though in your hearts, they're still your little babies, we have to plan for this transition time because there's a lot of um, uh, changes and things that you need to be aware of. We help families set up ABLE accounts and understand you know, how you can use that money and what the rules and regulations are and other places, other buckets where you can keep money so that it doesn't affect your child's benefits state or federal benefits. And we're here to advocate and educate. Um, you know, the owner of Consolidated Planning Group, Allison, has two special needs kids. And when she was going through all of this and learning about how to take care of her kids and how to plan and what she needed to do, she realized how complicated things can be. And so we decided as a company that what we want to do for you is kind of 
clear out the clutter and the noise and help you focus on what is really most important and what you really need to do um, without all this extra uh, research that you have to do. You know, we help, we've already done that part for you. So what, what it is important for you to remember is that, um, you know, there are over 263,000 financial advisors across the United States, 263,000, but fewer than 200 of those are focused on special needs like we are. That's less than a tenth of a percent of all the financial advisors across the United States who really focus on special needs planning. So you are in the right place. And please, if you have a question or a comment or something that you would like to add, please go ahead and put that in the chat box. And we'll be able to monitor that much easier. Um, so what we want you to think about as you're, you're stepping into planning for the future, uh, we know that you might be laying awake at night and thinking about what's going to happen when I'm gone. Who is going to take care of my children? How will that be funded? Uh, what do I need to know? We can help you with all of those things. Um, developing a care plan sooner will always be more helpful, not only to help you like start making plans and be able to sleep better at night, it gives you an opportunity to have a greater impact because you have time on your side. It also gives, gives you an opportunity to let your support team meet and get to know your child so that when the time comes that they might have to step in, it's not a big surprise. It's not like, who are these people, you know? Um, if you know it in the long term that, oh, maybe an aunt or another relative or a community, a residential community is going to help with your child, um, they can get to know those places and those people who are going to be there to support them. And that's so important that they can build that relationship. Um, you can think about what's going to happen after high school, you know. They can generally stay in high school until about age 21 or 22 with an after graduation program. But at that point, there are educational opportunities. There are vocational opportunities like April was talking about. And there are great residential communities. Um, so looking into those things ahead of time and making sure you found a good spot and that they don't have a really long waiting list or you get your name on the list. But you wanna to tour those, those opportunities and make sure you find a location, a community, um, a program that is a good fit. And also last thing that uh, we often talk about is if you are thinking that a sibling would be a great place or a, a great way for your child to be taken care of, just give that some really good hard thought before making that decision. Um, sometimes we find that the, the sibling who is going to be the caregiver, you know, they might feel a little sense of obligation and that can take away from the loving, friendly relationship if you're feeling obligated to take care of your sibling. On the other hand, the sibling who is going to be taken care of, they might feel a little bit resentful. You know, you're not my mom, you're my sister. And now you're trying to step into this parenting role. And I'm not quite sure I want that. Um, so just give it, give it careful consideration before you name siblings as a future caregiver. Um, I do have more slides at the end, but for now, I'm going to turn everything over to Tressy and have her talk to us about how she can help our families and what she does and why it's so important that you have a great attorney on your, on your support team as well. Well, thank you, Michelle. Um, it's a pleasure to present with you in April. We appreciate everything that you do for the families. And I'm going to open up my PowerPoint. Hopefully this is the right screen. Let me know if it's not. Michelle, is that turning up? That's not the right one, is it? 
And now we can, we see the pre presentation view, which is not the end of the world if that's what we use. Um, no, but I've got more than one screen <laughs> open. Let me see if, is that still presentation or is that still speaker view? It is. It is? Okay. I've got one more screen to share and let's see if this is the right one. Perfect. Is that good? Yes, that is correct. Right. And again, if you have questions or comments, please put them in the chat. I'll let Tressie know at the end of her, her talk what we need to answer. Right. Um, so thank you. We're going to talk about special needs trust because, you know, as Michelle said, we are really talking about making a great plan for your child. And we all work together as a team. So people like Michelle, like April, uh, your attorney, we work together as a team so that you've got a good plan in place. So a special needs trust is a part of that. To illustrate special needs trust, I'm going to show you some scenarios. Now, these are not real clients because of attorney-client privilege. I cannot tell you about my real clients. And if you're my client, I'm not telling anybody about you. But these are based on real situations. So let's imagine Izzy. So Izzy is a young adult. She lives at home. Um, and she's got a great life. She has an online business. She's got friends that she grew up with. She has activities having a great time. Now she is receiving SSI of 914 a month and she's got Medicaid um, that doesn't cover much. She's on her father's health insurance plan for medical care, but she's getting Medicaid waiver programs. Now these programs are actually paying her mom to be her caregiver and they're paying for supplies and diapers and a lot of other things like that. Because of those Medicaid waiver programs, her parents can afford to keep her at home. But her parents were so busy giving her a good life now that unfortunately they forgot to plan for the future. So Izzy's parents passed away without an attorney, without any planning. So they weren't wealthy, but they had house, cars, bank accounts, some life insurance, retirement accounts. All of that went to Izzy outright. Again, without proper legal counsel. And because it went to her outright, she lost her SSI Medicaid. So she lost the 914 a month, but she also lost the Medicaid waiver programs that were paying for a lot of her care. So what happened is the assets that her parents left her have to pay for everything out of pocket. They have to pay to replace everything that her parents did for free plus everything that Medicaid had been paying for. So as you can imagine, her care, her 24-hour, seven-day-a-week care, all of that was expensive. So what happened uh, eventually is after a number of years, the money ran out. So what happens to Izzy's life when she has nothing left, when she is destitute at that point? She can reapply for SSI and Medicaid and she'll get it. But what does that get her? Well, that gets her 914 a month for food and shelter and then basic Medicaid and the Medicaid waiver programs. So obviously she could no longer afford to live in her home. Um, she lost her dad's health insurance. Um, so she had nothing. And unfortunately for Izzy, she ended up in an institution. So she lost her home that she'd grown up in, lost her friends, um, her online business, everything that made her life enjoyable she lost and she lived the rest of her life in a room in an institution. And that's not what her parents would have wanted if they had planned ahead. Now let's imagine Andrew. So Andrew is also a young adult. He's living in a group home and he is living in a group home in the town where he grew up. Um, this group home happens to be more expensive than his SSI of 914 a month but his parents have gladly been paying that because he's happy there. He likes the guys that he uh, lives with. He likes his activities. So his parents saved their whole lives because they knew that Andrew would not be self-supporting. They knew that if they left assets to Andrew outright, he would lose SSI and Medicaid. So instead they left it to their daughter, Susan, because they said, Susan loves Andrew. We know she would use that money to take care of him. So the parents pass away, their estate goes to Susan, and sure enough, Susan loves Andrew, 
She uses that money to pay for the more expensive group home, his activities, all of that. Everything's going great until Susan died. So in your mind, think about what you think happens to that money when Susan dies. Well, when she dies, because it was in her name, it's distributed according to her will. It's her estate. Now, she uh, lived in California. She was married to teenage kids. Well, her will left everything to her husband and her two kids. So all of the parents' hard-earned money ended up going to Susan's husband and kids and nothing to Andrew. So Andrew is now destitute. What does his life look like? Well, all he has to live on is 914 a month and Medicaid. So he can no longer afford his more expensive group home. So he ended up in a group home that was paid for by the state, but it was not in the town where he grew up. He ended up with roommates who were mean. He ended up with the mean guys. Um, so again, he lost his friends. He lost his local activities. His basic needs were met, but not the things that gave him a good quality of life. It's not what his parents had saved their whole lives for. Now, let's imagine Kyle. Kyle is also a young adult and uh, living in a group home, and he's got a job. He works at Kroger. And again, it's in the suburb where he grew up, um, and everybody loves Kyle um, because he's known them his whole life. A lot of people will come to that Kroger just to see Kyle. Um, so his dad um, did planning. He went to an attorney, created a special needs trust. He named that trust as a beneficiary of his will, his life insurance, his retirement accounts. So dad dies and all the assets go in the special needs trust for Kyle. But the dad had to name a trustee, the person managing this trust for Kyle. And the dad had a brother named Bob. So Uncle Bob was the trustee, and he chose Bob because he was an accountant. But Uncle Bob lived in another state, and he didn't really know Kyle. So Uncle Bob said, you know, it's cheaper to live in my state, so I think I'm going to move Kyle up here. So that's what happened is Kyle had to go move to the state where Uncle Bob lived. Kyle was miserable. He lost all his friends, his support system here. Um, he ended up in a state where he didn't like the climate, he didn't find the people friendly, and he was miserable. So even though his dad had a special needs trust, things did not work out well for Kyle. So we're going to talk about how to avoid these negative outcomes with proper planning. So first, let's do a very brief overview of the government benefits. So today we're talking about SSI, which is Supplemental Security Income. This year, the maximum is 914 a month. It will go up in January. And this is for food and shelter. Medicaid is basic health care. And then there are Medicaid waiver programs. These can provide attendant care, respite, different therapies, residential supplies, and things like that. To be eligible for SSI Medicaid in Texas, and let me do an aside, I'm talking about Texas. If you are from another state, um, your state laws may vary a little bit. But to be eligible for SSI Medicaid, the individual must be sufficiently disabled and have low income and limited resources. So it's based on financial need as well. I'll talk about the basic SSI and Medicaid eligibility rules. Keep in mind that the waiver programs have different requirements. To be financially eligible for these programs, the individual has to have less than $2,000 in countable resources and less than $2,000 in monthly income. They have to meet the resource and the income limit. So even though those dollar amounts are the same, they're two separate requirements. So let's talk about income first. Um, if your child is on SSI, you want to keep their income below 1470 because if they make more than that, um, they will lose benefits. If they're not on SSI, they're just on Medicaid, they can have income of up to $2,000 a month. But what does Social Security consider income? Well, we know that if your child is working, they're earning wages, they've worked with April's organization to get a job, um, that is income. But there are other things that Social Security considers income. Because SSI is for food and shelter, if somebody provides food and shelter, that's income. If somebody gives your child cash, that's considered income. 
Somebody gives your child an asset that be, could be converted to food and shelter or that's income. That will reduce the SSI check. Now, if the, it's reduced to zero, then they will lose Medicaid. So as long as your child's receiving at least $1 of SSI, they will automatically get Medicaid. Under the deeming principle, if your child is under 18, the uh, government will look at the assets and resources of the parents and the income. But the minute your child turns 18, they no longer look at the resources and income of the parents. They only look at that of the child. So in many of our cases, the child is not eligible for SSI until they turn 18. Now, what if your child is living with you? You're providing food and shelter for your child. Well, that's called in-kind support and maintenance. And under the Social Security rule, that will reduce their SSI by one third of the maximum amount. Now, there's a way to avoid that one third reduction. And the most common way is for your child to pay rent. So for example, you could charge your child, and again, I'm talking about age 18, charge them $500 a month in rent, have a written rental agreement. Once you can prove that to Social Security, then their SSI is not reduced by one third. We talked about income, let's talk about resources. I would call these assets. Now, what they don't count against your child is if they own a house, a car, personal items, or 529 education accounts. What they do count is anything else. If there's a bank account in the name of your child, um, or an investment account, or savings account, or they own real estate that's not um, a homestead. Also, if you've created a custodial account for your child, um, we call those uniform transfer to minor accounts. Those will count against your child when they turn 21. I want you to be aware of how your child's benefits are going to change. If you as a parent start taking Social Security retirement, or you as a parent take Social Security disability because you're disabled, if your child was disabled prior to the age of 22, they will be eligible for the Disabled Adult Child Benefit. They will start drawing benefits based on your work record. So if you take Social Security retirement, your child will get half of whatever your check is. So if your Social Security retirement check is $3,000 a month, your child will get $1,500 a month based on your work record. Because that's more than SSI, they will lose SSI, but they'll get that higher amount. Now they can still be eligible for Medicaid, even though that Social Security check is higher. But the cool thing about this is once your child has been receiving this disabled adult child benefit for two years, then they get Medicare. So they'll have Medicaid and Medicare. And for many uh, families, Medicare is the golden ticket because not many doctors take Medicaid, but a lot of them will take Medicare. Now, Medicaid waiver programs, there are over 40 different programs in Texas with different eligibility requirements. Um, and so if your child's receiving a waiver program, we will look at the requirements and make sure we comply with those. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about um, regarding waiver programs, you wanna make sure you get your child on the interest list or the wait list um, today if they're not already on it, because if you um, have lived in Texas long, you know that the wait list for some of the programs is well over 15 years long. Now, there are some benefits that are not based on financial need, and this is Social Security, Disability, and Medicare. So um, if I became disabled, I could apply for Social Security Disability because I contributed to the Social Security system. That's not based on my financial need. It's based on the fact that I contributed to the system. And then Medicare is for people over 65 and some people with disabilities. So when we're doing planning for a family, um, you may not know if your child will need government benefits. Your child might be a minor and you don't know um, what they're going to be like when they're an adult. Um, they might have high functioning autism or Down syndrome. They're going to be able to work. You're just not going to sure if they're going to need a government benefits or not. What I recommend families is if you think your child may not be self-supporting for their lifetime because of their disability, I would recommend that you plan and go ahead and do a special needs trust. 
That way, if they need to qualify for SSI or Medicaid, they can. So special needs trust, my favorite topic, what makes them so special? So a special needs trust is like a magic document because we know that our kid cannot live on just SSI and Medicaid. Um, we want to leave something to them, but we don't want to disqualify them from those benefits if they need it. So that's where a special needs trust comes in is the assets in a special needs trust are not a countable resource. They do not count against your child for eligibility for SSI and Medicaid if it is done right. And that's the big caveat, it has to be done right. So what that means is if your child needs government benefits, they'll have a basic level of service and what you leave into that trust will supplement that. And the result is that with those two things together, hopefully they'll have a good quality of life. And then when your trustee makes distributions from the trust for your child's benefit, that's not considered income for government benefits purposes if it's done correctly. So what is a trust? Obviously, it's a legal document. It's a legal relationship. But when we're doing it for a child with a disability, it's going to be a blueprint for the future care of your child. In this trust, we're going to talk about the people that will be involved um, with the care of your child, the money and creating a safety net for your child. Now, qualifying your child for government benefits is not the only reason we use a special needs trust. When I'm drafting a trust, I draft it with flexibility for changed circumstances. So let's say that you passed away, there's money in this trust for your child. If they're on government benefits, the trust will operate as a special needs trust. But let's say your child is now working and they don't need government benefits, then the trust operates as a regular trust. So you're still providing for your child. Um, so we've got a lot of flexibility in this trust. But even if you're not sure if your child needs a special needs trust or benefits, think about if you left an inheritance to your child outright, um, would they be able to wisely manage that money for their lifetime? Also, if you left money to them outright, that money's not protected. Um, and we've seen this happen where Somebody finds out that they've got assets and that person comes and says, hey, I want you to invest all of that money in my business and I'll double it. Um, and then that money's gone. If you leave assets to your child in a trust, it can be protected from creditors, from predators, from divorce. Also, if your child is not able to advocate on their own behalf, we will embed some advocacy in that trust as well. There are two types of special needs trusts first party trust and third party trust. So a first party, you'll also hear this called a self-settled trust or a D4A trust that's named after the statute. This trust is created with assets that are considered your child assets. So for example, if you have a relative that leaves your child a hundred dollar inheritance outright, then if your child's under 65, we could put that into a first party special needs trust. Child support, we're gonna talk about in a minute, goes in a first party trust. Or let's say that your child has a large savings account and they want to qualify for SSI and Medicaid, they can put their own money in this trust. The biggest thing to know about first party trust is it has to have a Medicaid payback provision. That means that when your child dies, whatever is left in that trust first has to go to Medicaid to pay them back for anything they've spent on behalf of your child's medical care for your child's entire lifetime. So not all of, most of you don't need a first party trust, but in some situations we have to do this. Now a third party trust is created with assets that never belong to your child to begin with. So this is what all parents need because you're gonna leave your estate to a third party trust. The great thing about a third party trust is it does not have a Medicaid payback provision. So when your child dies, that money does not go to the government. Instead, it's gonna go to whoever you have named as a remainder beneficiary. That might be your other children. It might be charities or ministries or whatever. So planning ahead, usually we can use a third party special needs trust. So if you have a third party trust, how does your money get into it? Well, most commonly, 
by a will. So when I'm working with the parents, I do a will for each um, spouse and your will can leave that child's share to that trust. So for example, my husband and I have one daughter, her name is Jordan. So my husband and I are leaving everything to each other. But when the second of us passes away, our assets are gonna go to Jordan's trust through our will. Life insurance, and Michelle mentioned this, life insurance is a great way to fund the future care of your child. How does that get into the trust? It gets there by beneficiary designation. So again, my husband and I, we are each other's primary beneficiary on life insurance. And then Jordan's trust is the contingent beneficiary. Retirement accounts, IRAs and 401ks, again, these are distributed by beneficiary designation. They don't go through your will. So when I'm working with a family, I actually assist my clients in changing the beneficiary forms, or I work with their financial advisor so that we can make sure your child's trust is properly named. Now, there might be gifts. There might be grandparents that want to give your child a significant amount of money. They can put it in this third-party special needs trust. Child support, we're going to talk about that in a minute. So with this third-party trust, Upon your death, assets through your will, your life insurance, retirement will go into the trust. So quite often, the third-party trust will have nothing in it until you pass away or until you and your spouse pass away. And that's fine. You do not have to put anything in the third-party trust right now. Now, IRAs and 401ks, this is so exciting. So a few years ago, um, the law was changed. So if you've got an IRA or 401k, and let me just lump them all together and say IRAs, if you've got one of those or you've got some, you're getting tax deferred growth. You're earning income on those IRAs, but you're not paying income tax on that income. And then the next year, that income is earning income and so on. So you've got the power of tax-free compounding. You will not pay income tax on that until you take distributions out of your IRAs. If you're married, and you leave those to your spouse, they will do a spousal rollover and they get the same tax benefits. But what happens when you or you and your spouse pass away and it goes to the kids? If you leave these IRAs to non-disabled kids, they are now subject to a 10 year payout. What that means is that when you pass away and they inherit the IRA, once they reach the age of majority, they have 10 years to cash out that IRA. They can either take it all the first year, they can wait until the 10th year and take it all, or they can take 10 annual installments, whatever, but they're going to pay income tax on whatever they take out. So whatever that amount is, they're going to add that to their personal income tax. And if they're married, their spouse, that's going to determine their income tax bracket. So they could end up paying a lot in income tax. Now, there's an exception to that 10-year payout rule, and that's for beneficiaries who are disabled. So if you leave your IRAs to a disabled child, they don't have to cash it out within that short 10-year period. Instead, they get a lifetime stretch. So that money can grow tax-deferred for their lifetimes. So that tax-free compounding. Now, they will have required minimum distributions that start within the first year but the amount of that distribution is based on their life expectancy according to the IRS single life chart. So that means the distributions may start smaller and then grow larger over time. So that tax deferred compounding could go on for decades and grow that money significantly. So this is a chart where a family had a combined $1 million in IRAs. This is assuming a rate of return of 6%. You can see that that million dollars turned into almost $5 million. Now, the light green you see at the top of the, the chart, this is the required minimum distributions. And you can see that it's small at the beginning and then it grows larger. <clears throat> so the advantage of leaving IRAs to the special needs child is that lifetime stretch. The income tax hit is smaller because they're, they're spreading it out over possibly decades. And also your child with disabilities most likely is in a lower income tax bracket. Now, some of you are already thinking, well, if I leave my IRAs to the kids, won't that disqualify them from government benefit? 
Yes. Now, not all trusts qualify for this tax deferred growth. But when I'm drafting a special needs trust, I add language required by the IRS so that the special needs trust qualifies for this tax deferred growth. So we name the special needs trust as the beneficiary or contingent beneficiary of the IRAs. And then they get all those tax benefits, but then it won't disqualify that child from government benefits. So this is so exciting. And um, with this law change, um, a lot of my clients are leaving all of their IRAs to the special needs child and the special needs trust, and then leaving other assets to the other kids because those other assets, the kids don't have to pay income tax on it. All right, now child support, this is huge and not a lot of people are aware of this. In Texas, the court can order that child support can be paid for your child's entire lifetime if your child is disabled. But be aware when your child is under 18, it counts against them two thirds. But when they're 18, all of that child support counts against your child as income, regardless of whose name is on that check. So for example, let's say that the uh, a parent is ordered to pay $980 a month in child support. Because that's more than 914 a month in SSI, that child not only loses SSI, but also Medicaid and Medicaid waiver program. So it's an awful outcome. But there's a way to avoid that loss of benefits. The way we do that is to name a first party special needs trust um, so that the child support is paid through that trust. So what I do in working with the family is I draft that first party special needs trust. And then you would have your family law attorney, the divorce or child support attorney. They would be going to court to get the court to order it to be paid into the special needs trust. I provide that attorney with the language that Social Security and Medicaid require regarding the payment of the child support to the trust. That child support is funneled through a first party trust. It's used each month, but that way the child can get the child support and SSI and Medicaid. So this is crucial. Now, going back to our third party trust, let's say that you've passed away, there's money in this trust for your child. What can it be used for? First, let's talk about what it cannot be used for. Your trustee cannot give cash to your child or their caregiver. They cannot use debit cards or gift cards. That's considered cash. That will be considered income and would reduce their SSI. Typically, your trustee is not going to use the money for anything that's paid for by government benefits. But that leaves everything else. So really, anything you would have used the money for, it can be used for that. Plus, the trust money can be used to replace what you do for the, your child for free. All of their uh, personal needs, social, recreation, entertainment, education, medical that's not covered, um, uh, you know, dental, eye care, clothing, furniture, um, going to the movies, um, going on vacation or to camp or whatever, um, therapies that aren't covered, everything that gives your child a good quality of life. So how does your trustee pay for these things? If they can't give cash, they can't have a debit card, typically what they can do is they can pay third parties directly. So if your child is living um, in an apartment, they can pay rent directly, or there can be a credit card that's used for your child and the trustee can use the trust account to pay off that credit card. But the most useful thing um, is called a True Link credit card. You can get this credit card from truelinkfinancial.com. This is a great tool for our trustees. So what this is, it's like a preloaded card. So your trustee would get this card. And let's say your trustee wanted um, there to be $500 a month that's used for your child's miscellaneous expenses, like getting their haircut, um, transportation, whatever, um, clothing, those kinds of things. Your trustee can then transfer $500 from the trust bank account, load it onto this card, and then your child or your child's caregiver can use that. 
But the cool thing about the TrueLink card is that the trustee can limit where it can be used and what it can be used for. So if your trustee does not want it used for food and shelter, because that reduces SSI, they can limit it so the card cannot be used for food and shelter. Um, if your child tends to use money on something that's not helpful or it might be harmful to them, your trustee can limit it so it cannot be used for whatever that might be. So this is a great tool for our trustees. Really quick, a uh, trustee, is that something that they get when they set up the account or do they have to go somewhere special to get that TrueLink credit card? They would go online to truelinkfinancial.com and get that. Um, and it's not just for trustees. You could even do that now. Um, we've had some clients that use that for very elderly people who are getting taken advantage of um, so that that elderly person still has a credit card to go do things, but they can limit it so it cannot be used online or by phone. So a lot of cool uses for that. Thank you. Yeah. So we've talked about this trustee. So you want to name somebody to be the trustee of your child's trust when you pass away. Well, let's talk about what that trustee is going to do. They're going to make sure that the money is invested properly. They're going to work with your financial group, maybe um, Michelle's group. They're going, this trustee has to understand how to make distributions without affecting your child's government benefits. So they don't have to know how to do that today, but they have to be willing to learn. They're going to make decisions about how to use that trust for your child's care. They're going to keep good financial records and have an accountant file a tax return. So you can name a family member, a friend. There are also corporate trustees you can use. Now you're going to name a trustee and you're going to name a successor or two. So if that person dies, you've got somebody in line. Also, in your trust, we also may name a trust advisory committee that will um, work after you pass away. This is going to be a support team for your child and the trustee. And, and Michelle mentioned this as well, is we would ask you for the name of maybe three to five people who can help advocate on your child's behalf and be that support team. Um, and we're getting low on time. So I'm going to speed through some of these things. What if you don't have a special needs trust? Well, what if you don't even have a will? If you die without a will, the laws of the state of Texas determine what happens to your assets. Assets would go to your child outright and they could lose their government benefits. We don't want that. Um, we don't want you to leave nothing to that child, um, but we don't want you to leave it outright to other family members. We saw in our scenario with Sister Susan that when she died, that money went to her family and not to Andrew. But also, what if it went to Susan and she commingled it with her husband's money and they got divorced? That money could be lost. Or what if she got sued for bankruptcy or for a lawsuit for an accident? That money could be lost. Or even if she developed a gambling addiction, whatever. If you leave it outright to other family members, it's not protected. If you leave it in trust for your child, it is. What else do you need? We need a third party trust, you need a will. You're also gonna designate who you would want to be your child's guardian if you, both parents pass away. And um, we would assist you with beneficiary designations and also coordinating with other family members. So if there are any grandparents that might wanna leave something to your child's trust, we can help you with that. We also do powers of attorney for the parents. So if you're ever incapacitated, somebody has legal ability to assist you and your family. So, you know, Michelle talked about this, is you want a holistic approach so your team works together. ABLE accounts, you know, we don't have much time for this, but ABLE allows an individual to save up to $100,000 a year without affecting their government benefits. It can be used for disability related services. But the biggest thing I want you to know is that ABLE accounts have a Medicaid payback. That means that when your child dies, whatever is left in that account is going to pay Medicaid back for anything they spent on behalf of your child from the date the account is open. So as you're doing your planning, be aware of that. Um, we're not gonna 
spend a lot of time with this. Not everybody needs an ABLE account, but it's useful. Um, so some cool things is it can be used for education, housing, living expenses, all of those things. And again, if it's done right, it doesn't count against your child. The cool thing is that distributions from this account. So you've got money in the account and it's used for your child. That's not considered income to your child for SSI Medicaid purposes, even if it's for food and shelter. So for example, let's say that your child's living in an apartment and you're paying $1,000 a month for their share of the apartment. If you pay that directly because you're providing food and shelter, that reduces their SSI by one third. But if you put that $1,000 in an ABLE account and pay rent through the ABLE account, it does not reduce it by one third. Thank you Thank for you adding for that. because I think I saw that question in the chat box. <laughs> So when do we use ABLE accounts? We've used it like a child inherits $10,000. We can put that in an ABLE account or a grandparent wants to give them 10,000. If there's a 529 education account, they can roll that into this ABLE account and paying rent. All right, so another question is, when do you need to create a special needs trust? Will you wanna create it before you die or become disabled? We don't know when that is. The sooner you get it done, the sooner you'll have peace of mind. And Michelle um, mentioned that as well. So what is the result of wise planning? You're going to have this support team in place. You're going to have a financial plan for your child's care. Uh, they're going to retain that option to be eligible for government benefits and they need if they need it. But the result is just well-being, um, a more fulfilling life for your child. So let's quickly go back through our scenarios. What if these parents had done their planning correctly? So with Izzy, what if her parents had wills and they had a special needs trust for Izzy and their will left their assets to her trust? They had named her trust as the beneficiary of their life insurance and retirement. What that means is when they died, that money would have gone in trust and a trustee would use that for her care, but she would still get SSI and Medicaid and that Medicaid waivers were paying for diaper supplies, a lot of things. So we would have that level of care provided by the government benefits. And then what her parents left her would supplement that. What that means is that she would have options on where to live because she's got the money for it. If she wanted to stay in her childhood home, she could because she can afford to, or she wants to go live with a roommate in a condo, or she wants to live in a group home or whatever, she would have a choice. So she, she could have kept her online business, kept all of her friends, still would have had a good quality of life, and she would not have ended up in an institution. Now with Andrew, um, when his sister Susan died, it all went to her family. But what if the parents had created a special needs trust? Their estate went into that trust and Susan was the trustee. Well, then when she died, that money wouldn't go to Susan's family. It would stay in Andrew's special needs trust. And the parents would have named um, an alternate trustee to step in if Susan died. And what that means is that Andrew would have had enough money to stay in that more expensive group home. So he could have stayed in the community where he grew up, stayed in uh, the group home with his, the, his friends, and still had his activities instead of living in a state-run group home with the mean guys. Now, Kyle, his dad had a special needs trust. He had Uncle Bob as the trustee, but Uncle Bob didn't know Kyle. He didn't have a relationship with him. What if in the special needs trust, the dad had created a trust advisory committee? He would have named three to five people here in Texas who knew Kyle and they would be the support system. And they could have advocated on behalf of Kyle and said to Uncle Bob, we want Kyle to stay here in Texas and we'll be his support team here in Texas. And that way, Kyle would not have moved up, had to move to Uncle Bob's state. He was miserable. He could have stayed here, kept his job at Kroger, kept his familiar surroundings and all of his friends and his support system. And he would have had a good quality of life. So, um, when you do a special needs trust, you want to make sure that you work with an attorney that is very experienced in special needs planning because it's highly specialized. If we can help you, feel free to contact us. Um, again, we work with 
with uh, families all over the state of Texas. Um, we cannot do work for people out of Texas. Um, you would need an attorney in that state. Now, I'm going to stop sharing at this point. And Michelle, back to you. I will continue sharing my screen and go through a few more slides. Trustee, can you talk a little bit as I'm finding my uh, last couple slides about how much it costs to set up a special needs trust and how you do that? So when we're doing a special needs trust, we're doing a package for the family. So if we've got um, if we've got a husband and wife, for example, we're going to do a special needs trust for the child. We're going to do wills for the parents. We're going to do financial power of attorney and medical power of attorney for the parents, their HIPAA release, their directive to physicians, declaration of guardian, and then we assist the family with changing beneficiaries if they give us the forms for that. So typically you're looking at, for that whole package for a married couple, is $64.50. Um, we do like telling people ahead of time so that they can budget for that. The way our firm works is that we require if they decide to proceed, we require half up front, the other half in about a month when the documents are completed. Um, we can also do an hourly consultation. If you don't want to hire us to do the whole plan, you might just want us to look at what you have currently. We can do that on an hourly basis as well. And we do take checks. We also take Visa and MasterCard if that works better for the family. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, so up on the screen here are some of the other topics that we help with at Consolidated Planning Group, and we have webinars about. Um, actually, though, this page here, when you get this, this upcoming webinars link will take you to our um, website where we have all of our upcoming webinars listed out. You can see them and register for the ones that sound interesting to you. If you are unable to actually go to that webinar, um, we do email them all uh, just like we will with this one. This is our team. We have four advisors and five operations staff people who help keep it all together. We will be reaching out to you to see if you would like to schedule a consultation with us. Our free consultation is on Zoom. We ask you to fill out a short questionnaire ahead of time so that we have basically your, your demographic information and can speak to you without having to ask for all of that. Um, we want to answer your questions and then we'll tell you about us and how we work, the fees that we charge, the packages that we offer, and we help you determine what would be right for you, you and your family. And then if you choose to move forward with us, we go from there. It's no obligation to have that free consultation and just be able to chat with us and pick our brains a little bit. So you can use the QR code to schedule, or you can call the office or email us. Uh, like I said, we will be reaching out to you. So wait for us to call you if you'd prefer, and uh, you can schedule that way. Our links to follow our YouTube channel, Instagram, podcast and Facebook are down there. Um, so there are a lot of questions still in the chat box, Trustee, that we weren't able to get to. We do have just a couple more minutes. So I figured this is the best time. Um, I'll there get as many of these as I can. And if not, they can reach out to you, right? There is a question I would like to answer. Um, oh, good. The question is about, it says, if the child is receiving child support, would the parent need to become guardian of the estate to be able to manage the first party special needs trust and pay out? No, they would not. And that's a good question because guardian of the estate is different than guardian of the person. So you would not need a guardian of the estate for that because a trustee, the money goes directly to the trust. It's never in the hands of the child. Okay, very good. What about... um? The first party trust, can you set that up? Because that's what we talked about a lot today. Can you set that up at any bank? Do they know, like all the banks know how to do that? Or you have to set it up through an attorney, yes. But then once you have that, where where do you hold the money? So you would have a trustee and the trustee is going to have a bank account that they use to make distributions and probably an investment account with a financial advisor. So 
Most banks will let you open up an account in the name of the trust. Credit unions, maybe not. USAA um, for a while was not doing that. But yeah, most national banks, you just go in there with some trust documents and say, I'm opening up a bank account in the name of the trust, and they let you do that. Now, as far as naming a corporate trustee, there are some banks that serve as corporate trustees. Um, we would be more picky because there are some that specialize in special needs trusts. We want to would want to choose one that is specializing in special needs trust. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Um, what if the parent is the guardian? At, do they need permission to move out of the country or move states if you have guardianship? They don't know. Do they know. Don't know. Not if they have guardianship. Are there any states that are better to establish residency for a child that will be permanently disabled? Well, that's a good question for Google. Um, Texas is usually ranked one of the lower states in terms of having good benefits for, for people who have disabilities. Um, there are some states that are ahead of the curve and use, uh, you know, like we were talking about the waiver waiting list here in Texas, it's 20 to 25 years to wait for services. Some states have no wait. So those are some of the things that you might want to um, check on Google for. Or and if you're, if, if you're looking at a state that provides good services, um, California or Oregon, and then places on the Northeast coast, Anywhere that has high state income tax, they're going to provide better services. Yeah, no state income taxes te in Texas is great until you want that state income tax to pay for services. <laughs> Unfortunately, we can't have both, can we, Trussie? Right. Right. Well, we are out of time for today, unfortunately. Um, I do see that there's still questions in the chat box. So please, either if it's a financial side and benefit side question, you can reach out to the Consolidated Planning Group. If it's a legal side question, paperwork, you know, the documentation, the rules about that, it can be a Tressy question. Uh, but we certainly appreciate you being here today. Uh, Tressy, thank you for sharing all of your wisdom. April, thank you for hosting. Um, please reach out to us. You will receive these slides and a link to the recording. So you'll have what we did talk about and um, we're, we're here to help. So feel free to set up that consultation. Angela, look at our YouTube channel. Yeah. Thank you all very much. We'll talk soon. Have a great holiday season. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> Thank you all. Bye-bye.